Hello, and thank you for watching Atheist Talk. My name is James Zimmerman. I'm going to be your host for this episode. Today we're going to have a very fascinating discussion about Scientology. And to help us uh, tease out some of the facts and figures about it and their history, we have with us guest Chris Shelton. Welcome, Chris. Hello, thank you. Uh, so normally I introduce the guest and tell a little bit about them, but I think we'll just let you go ahead and do that in this case. So why don't you tell us, why, why do we have you here to talk about Scientology <laughs> and not just someone else? Sure enough. Yeah. Um, well, I was involved with Scientology um, as a member and then as a staff member and then ultimately as a C organization member uh, for a total of 27 years. So 25 of those years spent actually working for the church. Okay. So I have a tremendous amount of uh, scope of experience All right. with the organization. Sure, so you're speaking from authority and from an insider's look. That's right. And actually, this is going to be a two-parter show. Mm -hmm. So in this show, we're just going to talk about Scientology in general. But then uh, be sure to watch the other part because we'll talk about Chris's story uh, in specific, uh, such as the, those 27 years and how it is that he finally wound up here on Atheist Talk today. Right. So <laughs> It's just like an interesting story. Sure, yeah. So let's just start with the basics. Uh, what is Scientology? You know, what's the elevator speech for Scientology? Well, the elevator speech is Scientology is an applied religious philosophy. Okay. Uh, it is not uh, faith-based, they say. And, um, and it's, it gives you tools and techniques to improve your life and ultimately give you spiritual freedom and basically what they claim is that it will give you back your spiritual eternity. That uh, the, the basic, the real, the real core fundamental belief is that, that man is a spiritual being and that as a spiritual being he has led life after life after life. That life has been uh, a, a constant uh, burdening process mm -hmm. through traumatic experiences like dying and being born and then living a life and then dying again and doing this, you know, many, many times, okay. uh, there's all this traumatic experience. And all of that experience has burdened a man to the point where he's no longer aware of his spiritual self, much less how to uh, have spiritual abilities. Okay. So, so. do they self-identify as a religion? Yes. They do, okay. Yeah, very much so. And do they believe in any sort of deity? No, it's not, it's not that way. That's why they call it an applied religious philosophy. Okay. Um, where they, they, they call themselves a religion in the ultimate sense of the word of religion, meaning um, a subject that deals with man's spiritual nature and his relationship with life, other beings, and God. Okay. So that being their public relations right. chatter, the truth is that Scientology is a money-making scam, okay. and uh, they are really only interested in one thing, and that is getting as much money out of people as they can before they're finished with them. And if at any point along the line you sort of see behind the curtain and see what's going on, uh, you are kicked out, and uh, there are penalties involved in that where they can uh, basically shun you. Okay. So seeing behind the curtain, uh, that privilege must only happen to a small minority of members. Well, it happens to more and more of them, which is why they're sort of losing members like a sieve now. Oh, okay. I think we'll get yeah. into that. Yeah, later. yeah. Let's actually start at the beginning instead of Good. today in, uh, in modern times. How did, it, how did it begin? It started actually with the publication of Dianetics in 1950. Um, that's not Scientology, it's Dianetics. The Hubbard uh, said that they're two different subjects. We started with this thing called the science of the mind. That's Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health. That book became a runaway bestseller in 1950 when it was published in May. Okay. Um, Hubbard then had groups and, and individuals uh, coming to him and springing up all across the United States practicing Dianetics. And the, the promise was that you would achieve this state of clear where all of your past traumatic uh, experiences would be cleared away. And by doing that, they wouldn't be able to unconsciously or subconsciously affect you anymore. And so you would be living a life of much more self-determinism sure. and more ability. Peaceful, yes. Allegedly, sure. That's right. Okay. The, the target there was a part of a person's mind called the reactive mind. And that was the bad part of the mind. And that mind is the one that stored up all the traumatic experiences. Okay. Now what happened is that became such a success it actually got a bit out of Hubbard's hands. And uh, and he lost control of the thing. And so uh, in order to sort of get control back, he then came up with this new subject called Scientology. And Scientology is supposed to be uh, from skio, the, word, the old Greek mm -hmm. word skio, which is uh, knowing in the ultimate sense of the word, 
and ology study of, so it's the, the, the study of knowledge or knowing how to know is, okay. is what that yeah. word's supposed to mean. And he started this as a philosophy, and by 1954, he had uh, the bright idea to make this into a church. And so they started the first Church of Scientology in 1954. Okay, so this wasn't formulated in his mind in the late 40s when he was writing Dianetics then, huh? It just not sprung up. Yeah, not uh, as a church. Once he saw the popularity. That's right. Okay. Yeah, well, he lost control of Dianetics. Yeah. And then he needed to get it back. Right. And so, and so he started Scientology. After Scientology was started, he got trademark control back, oh, copyright okay. control back of Dianetics. And so now you have the two subjects. So it sounds like the first members were people that came to him or came to the Dianetics. Yes. But, but how do they recruit members now? Now they actually go out and try to recruit members or? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of interesting because these days there's not a lot of, uh, not nearly as much as there was in the 70s and 80s, overt, um, you know, proselytizing, proselytizing yeah. right? What they call, see it's funny, in Scientology they call it dissemination. Okay. Right? Scattering seeds, oh, right? I, yeah, sure, I get right? it. Yeah. That's the term they use. They never use the word proselytize. They use disseminate. But it's the same thing. It's going out and talking to people about it. And they actually have a whole methodology. It's very worked out. There's, the thing about Scientology is there's all kinds, it's all about methods and, and tools and, and you know, ways of doing things. It's all very precise. The only pro time I've been approached by Scientology has been very passive when things have come in my mail. Mm -hmm. Do they have other ways? Yeah, they have people, they, they call it body routing. Okay. They go out on the street and they, they literally will stand in front of a person and start talking to them or try to get them to come in for a free personality test. That's, that's how I got in and that's how they generally will try to get people in is they'll have them do this, this 200 question test which ends up with a graph of personality traits that are high or low depending mm -hmm. on the person's answers. They then sit down with the person and evaluate that graph and tell them what's wrong with them. And then once the person is what they call ruined, where the person has a, something that's ruining their life and the person acknowledges that that is ruining their life, whether it's they can't get along with their wife, they can't work well, they don't have money, whatever the problem is, uh, that thing is then the carrot to get them to start doing services courses or counseling okay. in the church so that they then start paying money to get into the, the, the organization. Has anyone ever taken the test and then the person administering the test realized that that person is not ruined in any way? Well, if they fail to do their job as the evaluator, then the person isn't ruined, okay. right? Uh, <laughs> sure. But there, there's, again, a whole procedure to this, okay. right? And there's a lot of room for, there's a lot of wiggle room in this test to, it, it's a lot like fortune telling. Right, because this test doesn't have any real scientific validity. Okay, it's, sure. Right, it's just a graph, mm -hmm. and uh, you know who knows how they came up with this thing. But, but you have like a a, a scale of 100 to minus 100, and there's traits plotted like happiness, responsibility, uh, you know, critical or uh, you know, get along with others, right, communication, mm -hmm. these kind of things. And so then they start basically taking stabs at, you know, oh well, this indicates that you have a hard time at your job. And there's sort of this fortune teller sort of look, right? And the guy goes, oh, yeah. And they go, okay. see, right? And then they'll go in on that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's not, you know, particularly, uh, you know, the guy's not responding to that, they'll go on to something else until they hit on something that the person, because who has every part of their life nailed? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And then and they're trying to find the thing that the person will respond to and say, yes, I want to deal with this, I want to handle this, sure. and no matter what it is, the brilliant thing about Scientology from a marketing angle is it doesn't matter what it is. No matter what part of your life is not going well, Scientology has the answer, so okay. they say, mm -hmm. right, no matter what it is. Uh, so how successful are they as far as the number of members that they had in the mid-50s to the number of members they have now? Well, it's, it's sort of, a, it's, it's a bit of a, it went up and then it crashed, right, okay. or it's crashing right now. They never, ever, ever had millions of members. That number was literally pulled out uh, from wherever. Uh, <laughs> so you're saying that they claimed that they had millions. Yes, they did. But They've, they never actually did. That's right. Okay. In fact, to this day, they claim they have tens of millions of members. Kirstie Alley went on Howard Stern last year in 2013 and said tens of millions of members. The church has always said millions of members. Um, 
these claims are grossly exaggerated. I, I know this because I have quite literally held the list in my hand mm -hmm. of active church members, and it was never more than a few okay. hundred thousand. Is it maybe, I'm just trying to give them the benefit of a doubt, yeah, of yeah, a doubt sure. here. Is it maybe that people who are on a mailing list or are just infrequent casual members somehow are counted in that tens of millions and then you're counting only like the really active people? No, it's not like that? No, okay. it's not like that. <laughs> they literally pulled the number out of a hat. Okay. Yeah. They have sold. I mean, you can't deny the fact that Dianetics has sold a lot of copies. Yeah. It's been a New York Times bestseller twice in 1950 and again in the 80s they got it back oh, on really? the list wow. okay. through, through good marketing, which they then crashed in 1990. Um, but if you count every single person who ever bought a copy of Dianetics as a Scientologist, even, I mean, okay, but that's sure. completely disingenuous. It'd be like saying I mean, everyone who owns a Bible is a Christian. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't work out that way. Yeah. You know, so, and if you count every single person who ever came into a church ever and did any kind of service, okay, maybe you get a million people, like, since 1950. Mm -hmm. But I, that, for me right now, that's stretching the truth. Oh, really? I don't nah. even believe okay. that. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, I've, like I said, I've seen the lists. I've seen the folders. They keep very exact records in the church of every single person who ever buys anything. And, uh, you know, that, that they don't have a million of those names. So it sounds like they peaked in the 80s? I believe so, in okay. the 70s or 80s. In the early 80s, there was a, there was a big shakeup. And in uh, 86, Hubbard died. New management took over, David Miscavige. And um, there were schisms. There were, there were like breakups. And there, were, there was a lot of shakeup going on in the early 80s. Okay. So I think that was pretty much their peak period. Okay. And how many members would you put? What was, what's the number you'd, you'd give that to? Uh, at then or now? Then in the early 80s. Then I, I couldn't totally speak to that. Okay. I would say at most um, 250,000. OK. And right. is that worldwide, or were they just yeah. always the United States? That's worldwide. Okay. They've been international almost from the beginning. Okay. And um, and now, I mean, I, I I'm I'm pretty sure at this point, with the with the figures that have been being looked at and the way we've been analyzing mm -hmm. it, it's probably about twenty-five to thirty thousand people worldwide oh, okay. at this point. It's pretty small. So when I think of a church, you know, it seems like there needs to be. I don't know, at least 30 people within an hour of each other in order to, to be able to meet together to form a church, right? So yeah. if, if there's only 30,000 in the whole world, how many, I mean, are there, how do they, how, are they, how can they be active and organized, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, how can there be more than 10 in Minnesota here? You know? Well, there's about 115 in Minnesota okay. here, right? I'm actually very familiar with the, okay. with the Minnesota church, and that's, I can actually list off the top of my head most of their names. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I was involved. They're going to scroll at the end of the Yeah, episode. I was involved with the, uh, with the Minnesota church here okay. for the last few years of, of my career as a Sea Org member. I was actually opened the, the new church building here and uh, worked at in it. In St. Paul. Worked in, in it, yeah. So there's a little over 100 in Minnesota. Yeah. And the majority are in the Twin Cities? Yeah, we're talking about right. actually in the five-state area. Oh, really? Around okay. Okay. Twin okay. Cities because there isn't... The closest churches from here uh, are Chicago and St. Louis. There's nothing okay. else around here. Wow. Yeah, and there's no subgroups or smaller activities. There's just nothing. There's nothing. So if you're a there. Scientologist in Des Moines or Madison, nothing. you're kind yeah, of yeah, no, in the nothing of down nowhere. there. Okay. Dakotas, nothing. Montana, nothing. You know, this doesn't exist. So at the beginning of the show, you mentioned there were different levels of members. Can you define that a little bit more for us? Well, there's, there's what's, what they refer to as the public, okay. right, which is you, me, just any Joe Blow who walks right. in off the street, doesn't work for the church. Then you have a staff member. And uh, there are different levels of organization. And they're divided up by the kind of services they deliver. Um, Scientology offers a route, what they call the bridge to total freedom, where you have uh, literally a chart of services, and it's, a, it's called the gradation chart. It's graded, mm -hmm. right? And you move up this chart. And the whole goal of Scientology is to get to the top of the chart, uh, which, by the way, costs about $450,000. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, if you just paid straight for the services. There's a lot more that you end up paying for along the way. But as a staff member, aren't you, aren't you employed by the church and making money from the church? 
uh, if you call about five bucks a week, okay. money, yeah. <laughs> All of the staff of the Church of Scientology worldwide are classified as volunteers. Okay. They sign a contract stating clearly that they are volunteers and that they expect no financial remuneration of any kind. Yet, the way the organization is run, they are treated as employees. They are expected to work overtime, full time, and heavily, heavily discouraged from doing anything else but Scientology. Yeah. Well, I would imagine this would make for some full days if you have to have a job where you're actually making money and then you need to also work for the church. That's right. In the eight years that I worked, um, I'm from California. Okay. And uh, pointing that way, that's where California sure, is. Sure, yeah, yeah, <laughs> roughly, yeah. Anyway, I'm from California and I worked, uh, when, I, when I joined Scientology and I worked for Scientology, it was in California. I spent uh, eight years at a local city level church in Santa Barbara. And that entire time I worked 80 to 90 hour weeks because I was working a full-time job to support myself and working full-time plus at the church. Wow. And I was discouraged from having that full-time job because it was taking away from my time oh, at the sure, church, yeah. even though I was barely eking out in existence. Uh, a couple other terms that we wanted to that I wanted to define are clear and OT. Can yeah. you explain what those may, mean? Because sometimes we hear those too. Totally. Clear is about halfway up that chart that I was referring to, and OT is the top half of the okay. chart. So is clear with reference to being ruined? Like you're no longer ruined? You're, you're in the clear now? Kind of. Okay. Uh, the clear has to do with that Dianetics thing. That, mm -hmm. that term was introduced with the, with the book Dianetics. And what it basically means is, if you can imagine a part of the, the theory goes that uh, by the way, there's no science behind this whatsoever, <laughs> but, you know, just dreamed up by Hubbard. Uh, the theory goes that you have an analytical mind and a reactive mind. There are two halves of what's going on up here. Mm -hmm. The reactive mind reacts. It's stimulus response. There's no thinking involved with it. And it is sort of the sum total of all the traumatic experiences that have occurred in your life that then are stored there and react upon you during times of stress, unconsciousness, uh, or um, anxiety, right? So you're having a period or a moment where things aren't going so well, you're a little tired. The reactive mind sort of will feed you commands based on these earlier traumatic experiences. There's a whole theory to it. And if it was workable, I'd actually expound on it because I okay. talked about it for <laughs> yeah. quite a while. It doesn't happen to work, but this is the theory. Clear is the state where you have removed all of that traumatic experience through Dianetics and Scientology counseling. They address all of those traumatic experiences that happen to you and remove them so you no longer have them influencing your thoughts or behavior, and so you are clear of them. So you have to be an active member to be in the clear, to be clear. To get to that state, yeah. yeah. You, you could leave Scientology after that and still be clear. Oh, okay. But um, it's not a, it doesn't depend on your membership okay. in the organization. It depends on how much counseling you've had. All oh, right, I get it. In the organization, right? And it's just a state to um, indicate that the person no longer is unconsciously influenced by these earlier traumatic experiences. And so they're clear. And this is to earlier traumatic experiences in previous lifetimes as well. It's oh, not so just a lot of baggage. Yeah, yeah, lots of baggage. Okay. Lots and lots. And then what's yeah. the time frame? Let's say I sign up today and want to start working to be to be clear. Well, if you went full bore, uh, flat out, just you know, seven days a week, went into the church, and we're getting counseling for hours a day. Uh, two, three months. Oh, okay. So quicker yeah. than I was thinking. Yeah, clear is only a stepping stone to yeah. OT. And OT. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, OT is operating, okay, operating Thetan. Okay, now Thetan is the word that Scientology uses to describe a spiritual being. They don't call them uh, ghosts or, or spirits or souls. They don't use those terms because okay. they have all that baggage connected with them. So Hubbard invented a word from Greek, theta. He calls them Thetans. And not Thetans, by the way, Thetans. Thetans. You get the British always oh. mispronouncing that. And it, yeah, I know, it's crazy British. So, <laughs> Always messing up our language. Yeah. <laughs> so Thetans are uh, the immortal spiritual self. Okay, you, you're not your body. You are this awareness of awareness unit called a Thetan. And operating Thetan is a, is a gradual state of existence where a person is spiritually free, okay. more and more free. 
And the ultimate uh, of this is a state where a person is, uh, Scientology terms it, cause over life, where they are, um, you know, uh, at cause over matter, energy, time, space, thought, form, uh, all aspects of life and livingness are at their control. Okay. So we have a few minutes left, but I want to touch on, because you mentioned this a few times, that Hubbard just kind of pulled stuff out of the air, yeah. you say, but, yeah. but what's his background? Did he have a degree in psychology or anything like, anything like that? <laughs> He's that a might science have fiction writer. Okay, that's <laughs> it? He was just... <laughs> yes, and, the, and a lot of the, when you, the OT levels, those OT states, they're all confidential, kind of like the upper levels of the Mormon church. You don't really know what's going on okay. there. However, it's all over the internet. And I can tell you that what's all over the internet is true. That is what it is. So we're talking about stories of old galactic civilizations and, you know, aliens and crazy stuff. It's, it's pretty wild stuff. Oh, okay. And you can just look it up on the internet and find it. So I think you're, you're kind of touching on it here, but I'll yeah. ask the question anyway. How can critical thinking help a person decide whether to join? Well, here's the thing. That, that personality test and those, those introductory services that they offer people are really where critical thinking is the most important because what they do is they have basically an appeal to emotion and they're very, very good at it. That's how that church has kept going all this time and that's how they get a hook into a person mm -hmm. and they offer uh, common sense based services that help a person with this thing, that they, this ruin that they have that they already have acknowledged is ruining their life, already acknowledged that Scientology can help them with it, so they're open to the right. idea mm -hmm. that this is gonna work. It then maybe helps them, maybe doesn't, but they're invested now, and so they then get into the next service and the next service, because no matter what you do in Scientology, there is always another thing to do, which costs more and more money. And yeah, so they've paid for this counseling. Yep. And the counseling might actually help? I mean, does, does it really? Is there some actual good advice that's buried in there that... Dianetics is, uh, a, has a limited workability as a form of regression therapy. Uh, and I say limited because, I, I have to stress that word, because Dianetics claims to be universally applicable to anybody, anywhere, anytime. And that's just not true. However, there are people who will respond to it. And just like they'll respond to almost anything, including a placebo. So you have that response and then the person is sold on it mm -hmm. and then they go in into the next step and the next step, right? And this ultimate state of operating Thetan doesn't exist. It's promised, but ugh, there's not one person who's been able to demonstrate cause over life. Oh, really? There's no one that can, How that you, gets that badge? No, I mean, we're talking yeah. about ability to levitate yeah. matter. I oh, mean, okay. We're talking about some pretty heady stuff. Yeah, Jedi. Yeah, well, yeah, and in fact, People in Scientology watch movies like The Matrix or Star Wars and they go, yeah, you know, we got the inside knowledge on Those that. Those are the people, yeah. But they never achieve it. And the cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. they, they can't get past it. So critical thinking skills are essential because they will prevent you from falling into that trap in the first place. And it was what I discovered when I got out of the church that really saved my bacon, so to speak, because I was able to sort of get myself untwisted out of the Scientology thinking mm -hmm. that really takes over every aspect of how you look at the world. And then in the f few minutes I have left, I, I kind of want to backtrack real quick, yep. because when we were talking about members, one thing that makes it seem like they are a lot larger than they are is that there's several well-known people that are Scientologists or yeah. have been. That's right. Do you want to speak to that for like one or two minutes here? Very quickly. Yeah. Hubbard personally wrote issues that target celebrities. He wanted celebrities for their PR per value. Sure, yeah. And so you get guys like Tom Cruise, John Travolta. I've met John Travolta. I mean, oh, he's a okay. nice guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are people just like everybody else. And you kind of learn that about celebrities when you meet a few of them is they're just like you yeah. and me. Mm -hmm. Just because they're on a big screen doesn't set them apart as beings. And so they respond to the same things, and when they lack critical thinking skills, they can fall for this just like anybody else. But they have great influence, and that's why Scientology goes after them specifically. Oh, sure. And they actually have special organizations called celebrity centers that target 
celebrities, just the celebrities, especially in Hollywood. I think I think I can see how that makes the numbers seem inflated too, because I think, oh, if it's reached these famous people, then surely, you know, for every one famous person, there must be 10 million people who are not famous exactly. that, that are members. Yeah. Especially when somebody like Kirstie Alley goes on Howard Stern's show and says there's tens of millions of Scientologists. Sure, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, you know, she says that because somebody told her For that. Sure, yeah. It doesn't make it true, mm -hmm. and in fact, it's totally fabricated. Okay. So if someone wants to learn more, um, can you tell us in a couple of minutes here, books, websites, magazines? Yes. Uh, Lawrence Wright wrote an awesome book called Going Clear, Okay. and he's a Pulitzer Prize winning independent journalist. He's not a Scientologist and never has been. And he wrote a very comprehensive look at Hubbard, the evolution of Scientology and what it really is, including a lot of behind the scenes uh, looks, you know, data about okay. it, right? And so, you think it's a really uh, well documented and accurate yes. book? Okay. It's, it's probably the most thoroughly fact checked book on Scientology that's okay. ever existed. Going Clear. Yes, it's called Going Clear. Right. And, and then what about on the inter interwebs? The best, uh, there, there are many blogs, sure. uh, many, including my own, um, on Scientology, but the longest running and most independent is one called The Underground Bunker, uh, which is TonyOrtega.org. And he's an independent journalist. He used to work for The Village Voice, and now he works for, oh, gee, I'm sorry. I forgot the name of the, the uh, he's an editor okay. for this other uh, magazine. And he has a daily blog on Scientology and the shenanigans that Scientology gets up to. And he just keeps that thing going every day. Is he a former member? How does he have the inside scoop? Is it he has a lot of sources. Him? Okay. Um, but he actually found out about it when he was at the Village Voice. He crossed, you know, it crossed his path, and he was like, "What?" One thing about Scientology is it is fascinating. It's oh, yeah, tiny. Yeah. It's a money-making mm -hmm. scam. It, but it is a fascinating thing, and there are lots of people who just—they're called never ends. They just—they were never in it, right. but they follow it. Yeah. Yeah, they don't—they don't believe it. They just follow along yeah. with what's going on with it. Because it's fascinating. Yeah, sure. No, I know. can understand that. Yeah. I've come across a few of those. Well, I suppose you'll probably be like that for the rest of your life, right? T checking it out. <laughs> kind of. I, I am. I'm, keeping as, tabs on what's going on. Yeah, yeah. As time goes on, I'm getting further and further away from it. But yeah. Sure. All right. Well, like I said, we're going to have a second part of the show where we're going to talk more about your story. Great. Uh, we've already touched on it, but I encourage people to to watch the second half because we'll talk about uh, how you came to be a Scientologist and how. It, came to not be a Scientologist. Great. So stay tuned for that, but we're out of time for this show. But I'd like to thank uh, you for watching the show. Uh, again, my name is James Zimmerman, and this is Atheist Talk. And if you'd like to find out more about us, please visit the website or write to the address that you see on screen. We'll be happy to send you a copy of our newsletter, The Minnesota Atheist, that tells you all about uh, atheist-themed gatherings and events that are going on in the Twin Cities here. Because if you're interested in us, we're interested in you. Again, thanks for watching.